Martin Scorsese's lifelong passion for film has fueled a remarkable career dedicated to movies. A graduate of NYU, Scorsese worked as an editor until Who's That Knocking at My Door caught the attention of Roger Corman, who asked him to direct Boxcar Bertha. In 1973, he attracted critical and national attention with Mean Streets. The films that followed reflected a taste and talent for a wide range of subject matter. Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, After Hours, Goodfellas, and The Age of Innocence are just some of his films. Casino is his anxiously anticipated new film. It is another collaboration with Goodfellas screenwriter Nick Pileggi, and it stars Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, and, Sher and Sharon Stone. I'm very pleased to have him back at this desk for a consideration of Casino and whatever else he's been doing. Welcome back. Well, it's great to you. see you. Yeah. Uh, I saw you almost two years ago. We just happened to see each other at a dinner, and, and or maybe it was almost two years ago, wasn't you know, it? Yes. And you yeah. said you've done nothing but work on nothing this film but since. but cas but casino until about eight o'clock last night. And what's where is it right now? Because you're going to go. When is it going to be released? It opens. Uh, it premieres Tuesday okay. in New York. Um, and you're working on it last night. Well, a minor mi minor mixing details, yeah. and some of it was over the phone, in fact. But uh, my editor, Thelma Schoonmaker, and my cinematographer, Robert Richardson, is out in the West Coast right now trying to conjure up uh, a dupe negative that yeah. would be suitable to make prints from. Um, and they're maybe a little bit uh, hit and miss, but they're getting there. They, they'll be able to do it by the end of the week. Did Pileggi bring you this idea? Yes, he did. Yeah, he brought me the idea uh, two and a half years ago. And what he brought me really was a newspaper article about a husband and wife uh, domestic squabble on a lawn yeah. at about 7 in the morning uh, in, in Las Vegas. And from that article... Um, the whole story right. unravels. Uh, all the elements come together in that sequence, and that's the way we try to structure the picture. That that article and that uh, scene on the lawn was so vivid for me, and and, and it, it became um, uh, it became so uh, meaningful because of the relationship between the husband and wife, and the difficulty in their relationship, and the domestic fighting, and that sort of thing, yeah. brought down not only themselves but an entire empire. You must see this as larger than just another gangster film uh, yes how yeah. do you see it well I, I always imagine I said well you know I was I was I was interested in doing it I said but the only way to really make this one I said yeah, obviously I'd want Bob in it Bob De Niro and it's a perfect part for Joe Pesci you know and it'd be wonderful it'd and be Harvey like, would have been in it except he was Har off somewhere Harvey was somewhere else as yeah. usual yeah. making yeah, another right. picture he makes right. 15 a year thank God and uh, he um, I said I really really need to, uh, I needed to expand the story I said if it's gonna be about Las Vegas and it really deals with the end of Vegas uh, of a certain period in time, by 1983, 86. Mm -hmm. um, in my mind, it became something like an urban western, where it was really the end of the old Wild West, the real end of the Wild West, in a way, where things were wide open. Um, and I figured that it had to be a picture where you could have these characters go through a real um, uh, breadth of a story, mm -hmm. uh, the, the depth of a story. And I figured at least a three-hour film. A three-hour film. There's no sense in, in doing another gangster picture in the sense that I felt Goodfellas yeah. was very, very, um, it was really very precise about the way of life. Granted, this story deals with a higher yes. level. Yeah. Um, and Pelleggi told me that yeah, this was a much higher, higher level. Of much higher level. And also set in an American city. And uh, what threw me was when we started working on the script, it was January 2nd, 1994, in a hotel, Nick and I, and I looked at Time magazine, and the cover had the MGM line on the cover, and it said, Vegas, the American city. Yeah. And I said, well, if that's the, uh, if that's the, if that's the truth, then... Uh, we got a story. Yeah, we, we have a story here. <laughs> this is the American city. I mean, they're talking about the new Vegas, but, yeah. you know, the sense of uh, Vegas and what it represented represents uh, chance, luck, you know, everything wide open, a place for, at that time, the old Vegas in a way, a place for gangsters, hustlers, gamblers, and that sort of thing. Um, and it had a kind of romance to it. Uh, which now has changed radically, you know, but that aspect of calling it the, the American city of today yeah. for the future, that could be a dangerous now, thing. Do you have to sell De Niro on doing a film with you or do you just call up and say, are you busy? And he says no. And you say, let's go. Oh, no, not necessarily. Uh, it's always has to do with, always has to do with character. If it's a character that you think is right and he agrees, then it's a deal. Or if I think if I think it's right and he gets interested in it and we start working on it because that's what we were doing on the script. Um, we worked on a few things over the past few years where we would get halfway through the script or halfway through the script writing process and we'd find that we just weren't able to pull more out of it for him as a character and we dropped it.
he would decide not to do it because it's yeah. just not or something myself that too and you, I are you yeah would. both of us both of us uh, realize that maybe it's just not because it doesn't really pay for us to uh, do pictures again unless we could find other things to do like max katie for example was a yeah. over-the-top theatrical uh, wild performance of his and i found things that i wanted to say in cape fear that didn't interrupt what he wanted to say which is the way we always worked raging bull also mm. and like what would we do that that's new and so we found uh, in this particular character the Ace Rothstein character, we found that uh, we could chart some new territory. What is it about him that makes him so good? I wasn't, years ago, I was not able to articulate it, but there's something about him he could take. It's one of the reasons I had the stroke of luck of making a few good pictures with him that uh, a lot of people kind of like. It's Taxi Driver and Raging Bull, um, even to, uh, to a certain extent, Goodfellas, where he plays people, play, takes characters that ordinarily are your villains mm -hmm. in a film. And in my pictures, I like to make them the heroes in a way, or your quote hero, unquote, you know. And um, there's something about him that's very compassionate as a person. He's one of the most compassionate people I know, a really good man. Um, and he just has that ability to trans to um, relate that to the audience. The audience feels for him. They feel for this character. And therefore, there's no uh, character that he plays that is irredeemable. Yeah. So and he has some way to give that audience a way to hook into whoever he plays. Yeah. It's his face, Something it's his moves. Really... It's, not only, it's not only his face, it's his, it's his, it's his natural, natural, uh, his natural instinct in a scene. Sometimes we're improvising. He'll, he'll invariably, invariably do something that is, uh, that, is, that is quite extraordinary. Once you start shooting, do you direct him? I mean, do, do, <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah. I mean, or is it most of it you to talking it out before talking and then out, once mainly. he gets it on the well, set, once he, once he gets there there's no sense of saying no. you know basically we do a lot of a lot of uh, no no we we do a lot of it in um uh well on taxi driver the script was so solid there was no need to uh, to introduce uh, bob during the the uh, script writing session because paul wrote it himself schrader he wrote yeah. it himself we got it bob, brian de palma gave it to me yeah. uh michael and julia phillips got it whatever that story is but a raging bull by the time we got to do raging bull um we worked very closely together on the script and in that process because we wanted to do something very special. This is after Mark Martin had written the first drafts, and then Paul Schrader came in. Mm -hmm. And when Schrader uh, did two drafts, gave it to us, we walked, we went away to an island. He took it to an island. Bob likes to go to islands. I'm, I'm an urban person. <laughs> it was very strange. Uh, uh, palm trees and things. Beach, you know. And it was very nice. It was very, very secluded. And we worked for like uh, two and a half weeks on Paul's uh, version. And we were able to literally make the film right there. We just made the film. Basically, we did. Every, we said everything we had to say. We found that we were going along the right areas with each other. I also found that he was doing things that I didn't even need to know, and he knew that I was going to do things that he didn't need to know. And so that he became very, very uh, uh, reasonable and workable when I was doing very, very intricate shots in the ring, because he knew that something special I had in mind was going to come out of this, uh, including that sequence where he gets beaten up by Sugar Ray Robinson, which takes only 20 seconds of film time, but took 10 days to shoot. Most people would believe that's your best film. Do you believe that? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I mean, to me, is, uh, is it your favorite? I, I like it, but I, m most of the, all the films I make, I really don't go and revisit them. Um, I, uh, I don't look at them really. Yeah. No. But uh, do you make too uh, personal? I can't. Uh, yeah, but I mean, <laughs> Dawn Steele and other women in your life yeah. have always talked about your one of the wonderful things about you, and I just know because she's told me, but yeah. that you, I think Barbara. Yeah, I mean, talked about this too. Is it you infuse them with your love of movies, all about movies? You are known as having this encyclopedic <laughs> knowledge of film in terms of being able for a whole series of films tell you every credit that. Well, at, on the at, movie. at some point, I mean, really, I can do that mainly from films in the '40s to the '50s to the early '60s. When I started working on films myself, I started seeing less of them. Yeah. You know, but I think what, what we're really talking about is that uh, it's not just movies, that they're not just movies to me. They're, in many respects, uh, having had asthma, my father taking me to the, to the movie theater yeah. constantly because yeah. he couldn't, I couldn't play sports or anything. He never really talked to me very much when I was a kid. And so that was a way of talking. That was a way of, of experiencing strong emotional, whether it, was, whether it was Kirk Douglas and Lana Turner in The Bad and the Beautiful, or it was James Mason in The Desert Fox, or it was uh, uh, On the Town, or American in Paris, uh, you know, any of these things. It was a way of experiencing emotion, of feelings. If I wanted to say I loved you to him, which I didn't, 
it was yeah. through that film, you see, yeah. and the same way with him to me, and my mother to, to, to a certain extent also, my older brother too, and so in a funny way, they're not just movies to me, it was a way of expressing emotion and a way of learning a little about life and uh, using these as examples um, of how to live, a, <laughs> you can't take, uh, I mean, not every film, what I, what I mean by that is that it's like, um, it becomes about life. The pictures I make, I'm talking mm -hmm. about, it becomes about the fact that, yes, I adore these old movies and everything, but I can never make them. Uh, I wish I could have, but I, I not. I'm, I'm what I am. I do what I do now. And in the process of making the picture, I try to learn about myself, learn about life. And, and I think talking about infusing enthusiasm to, to other people about it, it's mainly about that, not about the films. Well, I'll talk about a certain scene in another film that was made 20 years ago, and we can laugh about it, act out the whole scene, and then we go to shoot our scene, and we're sort of revved up yeah. for that energy level, you see? But there's a certain kind of truth in those scenes. There's certain kinds of truths in Vincent Minnelli's uh, um, uh, film version of Lust for Life, in scenes between Anthony Quinn and uh, uh, Kirk Douglas, where they're arguing about painting and art, yeah. you know? And then suddenly that snaps something, and you go off into another scene for yourself, and, and it, uh, uh, we try to find the truth in those things, and, uh, because the truth is is uh, enjoyable and painful and uh, a lot of fun. You've always wanted to make a Western or not, because you talk a lot about John Ford. <laughs> yeah, well, I can't. How could you make a Western? You can't. But How you, could you? You can't. What do you mean you can't? You... Well, I, I mean, well, I got close in the casino. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen it yet, but there's a, there's a wonderful scene in the desert. Yes. The only the, the guys in the desert in this one, they're two little figures in the desert. They're wearing silk suits and sunglasses, so they're not, they're not exactly cowboys, but uh, Orleans of Arabia. Uh, but uh, it's a private meeting that uh, Joe Pesci has with De Niro in the middle of the desert, so they can talk private. But I... You know, the reality is the tradition of the Western, uh, 1917, John Ford, right. William Wyler making one reelers each week, yeah. Cecil B. DeMille coming in, and, 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 and literally with the Western, creating a new language, don't, don't even, not even mention Griffith and Thomas Inch and right. people like that who were already working. These guys was trying to figure out if you come in left to right, how the, what's the next cut? Should, uh, what's the right screen direction? You know, they didn't even have the word for screen direction. They were inventing all this language, you know. And so that uh, um, the uh, Western is, is a part of Americana that I'm not a part of. I come from a East so Coast. I'm more, I'm more European yeah. than, than that, you know. And it's in a funny, I mean, my, my roots are more towards uh, Italy or, or uh, Europe than, than, uh, than it is up West. I loved seeing Westerns when I was a kid because that was the outdoors for me, yeah. especially those old Technicolor Westerns or any story, any cine color film uh, about wild horses was great because, you know, he was living in a small apartment. Know. He had the yeah. beautiful wild horses running. He could see this Palominos going by and that sort of thing. But um, I could never go near a horse. I would sneeze. Was there always or is there a fascination on your part for violence? I think the violence um, and this particular film, Casino, has got mm -hmm. some very strong violent scenes in it. And, and it's a very a, powerful there's picture. There's a vice and yeah, you know, putting yeah. somebody's head in a vice. Yeah, all based on true stories. popping out and stuff well, like that popping a little out okay, anyway but uh, right. <laughs> but the thing about it is that no it really is a uh, is based on very strong the violence itself is a uh, is a matter of expression and it's the way of life and if it's the way of life for these people what happens to them at the end is important yeah. where they wind up like in goodfellas you know if you think it's fun for the first hour of goodfellas well look at what happens to them in the last hour and a half and in casino especially based on true stories or aspects of true stories um everybody pays everybody pays I mean, it's the old story, live by the sword, you die by the sword, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a shocking thing. And I think what happens with violence, I mean, I grew up in an area which was pretty strongly um, um, expressive that, in that way, we put it that way. It was right off the Bowery, yeah. you know, um, and uh, uh, people were more tactile. They touched a great deal, and so, so very often, even sometimes you would swear that two people were arguing or yelling at each other, and actually they're having a great, a fun conversation. So it, that kind of expression... Uh, is very important to me, and uh, um, the lifestyles of the characters that I'm working with usually in these films uh, incorporates a great deal of violence, and but, so you've got to be as truthful to that as possible. And then, having said that, though, of all your films that have touched on violence, whether it's Taxi Driver yeah. or, or Goodfellas or, or Raging Bull, even in its own way, um, there is Age of Innocence, mm -hmm. and you and I talked about that yeah. at length one evening. Yeah. Um, it didn't. It didn't resonate for whatever reason as much as I assumed you liked it. Did, how do you feel about that now, now that you put some distance between you and Age of Innocence? Oh, I like the film. I mean, the, res the resonance for the film for me is the passion that can't be expressed. Yeah. That but, cannot be expressed, you know. 
What do you mean? Uh, his passion for her and her passion. Oh, for I him. see. The passion that could not be expressed because yeah, of the it's, nature it's of the, the society. De- it's the detail the of, of the shirt he wears and and the way he's looking at her. And that's that. That was the interest of the film for me. Maybe I misunderstand the question. No, no. But the question was: Is that it didn't? I mean, it, you didn't get as as it wasn't as it wasn't as successful in some way as other films that you have made. True. Even though. My sense is you had great pride in that film, yeah. and you poured yeah. a lot into it, and you spent a lot yeah. of time, and, and, and it was a d- departure for you. It right. was reaching out to go in a different direction. It was pushing the envelope somewhere else. Right, exactly. Pushing the envelope is a good expression because um, if I'm going to do pictures like Casino and Goodfellas and things like that, each one like that has to have something special to it. And Casino certainly does. It has the aspect of yeah. Vegas, of Vegas is the American city, etc. Right. Um, no reason to do another mob picture. Not for a long while until I can find... You know, God willing, something comes around that I could find another angle to it that I could learn something further from, which I learned on this picture. How to tell a story, right. an epic story of greed, you know. Now, the thing about Age of Innocence, it's, like, it's not like, I'm not, not uh, silly enough to think, oh, yes, this is the film I'm going to be remembered for. No. If you are remembered, number one. Yeah, well, number one. If you are remembered. And if you are remembered, it's going to be the, the pictures that normally, uh, it's like a Mean Streets or a Taxi Driver or Goodfellas or Raging Bull or... Uh, Maybe, uh, I don't know. It's, it's the, the, that, those territories where I feel um, uh, I'm dealing with characters and worlds in which I, I can really um, f- express myself with comfort and ease um, and uh, a closer grasp of a certain reality and truth. Um, no matter how harmful or, or, or difficult that truth is to take for, for the characters in the film I'm talking about. Where would about. you put Last Temptation? Uh, Last Temptation is another. Uh, I, I tried to... Uh, uh, and Last Temptation, it's a good question. Uh, Last Temptation uh, deals with the same themes all these other pictures deal with, only it's head-on directly with the iconography of Christianity. Yeah. And maybe the others are more successful than that because of that. You see, maybe sometimes when you, hit, when you deal with it head-on, it's never as good as the, um, as the uh, uh, slipping in the ideas and, and uh, uh, the allegories and metaphors yeah. and that sort of thing. But uh, Last Temptation was something, oh, that, that's something I'll always go back to. I have no problem with that. I mean, that in terms of a religious film or film dealing with the saints, so what makes what really makes a saint? Yeah. You know, that the, sort of thing. Does the making of movies still have the same magic for you, the same joy, satisfaction? Well, as you get a little older, um, and the pictures sometimes, they all get harder. Why? Uh, well, I'm trying in each one to try something new, to push an envelope, as you were talking about in Age yeah. of Innocence. I'm not, I, I know that the people say, well, yeah, that... Uh, that Age of Innocence is a picture where it's not going to be representative of the kind of work I've done right. normally. But uh, I want to learn something, too, as a director. And uh, as long as I can have some sort of an umbilical cord of emotional uh, resonance, uh, uh, some way in which I could b- feel what those characters are feeling, then I don't care what they're wearing. <laughs> I don't yeah. care what age it takes place in. Then I, can you go ahead? No, I was just saying, I, basically what I do for, for uh, relaxation is read... Uh, uh, novels yeah. of the Ancient World by Mary Renault to Robert Graves and that sort of thing. Can you then say that, it, that it, what, do you, what is it you learn about character in Casino? And what do you come away with that? Well, I think for me in Casino, what, what it is, is it's a very simple thing. And it's like a classic story of uh, people's pride and greed. It's just going to the point to the level where they bring down themselves and bring down an entire empire. Just when they have it yeah. all together. Just when they had it all. You know, and it's just for me the human story. It, is it their natural instinct overtaking them? They cannot be divorced from their natural instinct. It, that's, that's greed one was thing. part of what they were. Yeah. And then they reach for something else. For some reason, wanted to put that past behind them, but somehow they can never cut. Never that. do it. And also, they're in a place like Vegas, which makes that happen. Because yeah. it's a wild place. Why Sharon Stone? I mean, not why not, but why Sharon Stone? <laughs> I, mean, you know, I don't. Sharon. Um, well, her name came up a number of times. Her. Yeah. Uh, her name came up a couple of times. Uh, we talked about her. There were a number of ladies involved with the uh, auditioning process. They were all quite good. And that's interesting because you said you insisted that everybody had to audition. Yeah. And some of the. I had pe- to. Because. You know, well, I want to hear what happens. I want to see. There was a certain level of, of energy that uh, I wanted her, this character, to get yeah. to. And so did De Niro. We wanted this person to get to the point where they didn't care what they were saying, they were so outraged. And we don't want anything, anything to be held back. And uh, very often that, uh, that happens. That's why you need to hear it come from somebody. Because I don't care if other, peop- other films they made. 
it's a different way. It's a different director. It's a different actors, different story, a different atmosphere, a whole other thing. We needed to just get in the hotel room and work out a few scenes. That's all. And uh, a number of ladies were quite good at it. But when it came with Sharon, Sharon has a, she had such determination to do this picture, to play this woman, uh, Ginger. And she had... Uh, expressed in what way in terms of, of her sense of saying to you, I've got to do this, I mean, I'll show you whatever you... An enthusiasm. Yeah. Yeah, an enthusiasm. I want it badly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she, wasn't, she wasn't coming in begging for it, but the, the no, idea was... No, I don't mean that, that yeah. but I mean, as a professional but, way to say... Yes. I can be ginger. Yeah, exactly. And now, what I also noticed about her was that she has a certain screen presence and these other films that she made, and uh, uh, it seemed to be just the right look for the character of Ginger, to come out of Vegas in the early 70s. Yeah. It also looked like, she also was the closest one to look like the person, one of the persons that it was based on, in reality. Who was his name dead. Jerry? Yeah. Right, Jerry? Yeah, right, yeah, I yeah. Think. Was it? I don't yeah. yeah. remember what the Jerry, I mean, I was, yeah. Nick Pelleggi was here talking about. Yeah. Let's take a look. This is a trailer, which is a way that they uh, use the, to promote the film in the theater. You've seen them, it's a coming attractions kind of thing, but it gives you a feeling for what Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci and Sharon Stone have done with Nick Pelleggi's script. Here it is. He's a loose cannon. No! Stop it! You want to get rid of me? Here I am. Go ahead, get rid of me. The music. Yeah, what I, what I did with the music uh, was pretty much what I did with Mean Streets back in 1973. I compiled music over the past 30, 35 years uh, and uh, listened to... Uh, I li it's basically composed of music that I listen to all the time. Yeah. And I, I've, I've put them onto DAT tapes um, the past five years now. And I may have 26 tapes from A to Z and uh, uh, 12 from the 1960s. Five, I have 15 from the 50s alone and uh, a DAT tape. So that's like 44 songs in each, each tape. And so um, I was listening, like we're talking about in the, going to, to the uh, penthouse at the Mirage. On a right. Saturday night, I had the earphones on listening, and it was during pre-production, started making notes. Ah, yeah. theme from Picnic. Yeah. Why not use the Moonglow and theme from Picnic? Because that was a popular song at the time. You know, th these were songs you could play in a jukebox in the early, late 50s or uh, early 60s, um, even though there were themes from other movies. It didn't matter because uh, they were part of your life. They were heard on the radio all the time. Um, also, Walk on the Wild Side, uh, Elmer Bernstein's Walk right, on the Wild Side, right. played by Jimmy Smith, is on the radio all the time. Why not use it? It doesn't matter if it's a theme. So that sort of thing, and it's a compilation of maybe, I think there may be, I don't know, 50, 60 pieces in the picture here, in and out. Sean Penn was here, uh, and he talked about John Cassavetes. Mm. Um, there is a story, which may or may not be true, about you and Cassavetes, yeah. after Boxcar right. Berther. Yeah, yeah. Cassavetes comes to you and says, Look, you, you can do a lot better than this. Or yeah. if you really want to make movies, they have to be personal. They yeah. have to, well, you tell me. He, he uh, took me to his office and uh, it was at Universal. And he was always very funny, John. He was like, <laughs> he's laughing. He looked at me. He's <laughs> you know, career. Yeah. And he grabbed me and he embraced me. And then he pulled me aside and he said, you just, you just spent a year of your life making a piece of junk. He said, it's a nice picture. It's a nice film. Girl is good. The guys are good. You know. You could do better than that, he said. You can't get stuck. I know you like B movies. I, I know you like the old movies coming out of Hollywood, but you do different things. You just do different things, and uh, you, you should really stick to what you know. Uh, and in a, in a sense, there I realized, yeah, maybe he's right. The, the reality is I'm not a Hollywood director. I mean, a director from the, the ones I wanted to be, right, like, right. like yeah. John Ford and or Howard Hawks. He understood that. that sort of yeah. you, you wanted yeah, to he, make... You want to remake John Ford. You want to find yes. your way to be like right. John Ford and like Billy Wyler and all those. Right. But what I did have in mind was to combine what I knew, yeah. which was really a kind of um, a combination of a uh, uh, certain kind of reality with the actors that I saw Cassavetes mm -hmm. and Kazan have. And uh, mix that with the tradition of a, a Ford or an Orson Welles um, with the use of camera uh, and that sort of thing. So I was trying to combine it all. Uh, I, I got close, in, in, um, but it wasn't completely su successful in New York, New York, right. to a certain degree. It wasn't the wasn't completely successful film, but um, I realized then that the only way to go, he said, don't, don't you have something you really want to do? And I said, yeah, well, this one script, Mean Streets, that we've been working yeah. on for about five years. He goes, well, take it out. Rewrite it. I said, we'll need some rewrite. Well, rewrite it. Just what are you doing here? <laughs> yes. Just rewrite the thing, will you? Yeah. So we worked on it, a couple of friends of mine worked on it, and we uh, sent it around and uh, yeah. uh, gave us that shot in the arm we needed. Within a year, through uh, some mutual friends, uh, we met Jonathan Taplin, and uh, he had the money to make the film. Yeah. 
What's been the downest moment for you? When have you been in this really wonderful arc of a career that, that is going strong with this casino opening here? When has it been for you where you questioned yourself? Uh, Never. Not, not, no, not to, not to uh, seem facile about it, but the, you do question yourself most of the time because it keeps you sharp, questioning yourself in terms of the work you're doing. Yeah. Uh, is this the right thing to do? Is this the right picture? Well, if I have this angle on it, there's certain kinds. I didn't question myself doing Last Temptation. Yeah. I didn't question myself doing Age of Innocence. That's for sure. And uh, but you um, ask yourself, for example, in Casino, yeah, is this a different story? And is oh, there something larger here? And yeah. how do I yeah. justify making for me yeah. to make this film? Yeah, exactly. And I found the ways, and I found yeah. it's in a sense a metaphor for 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 us if we don't watch out in this country, you know. Where the compassion goes out the window and just more money, money, more money, the more blood. Yeah. It's as simple as that. That's what the film shows. And it's as, it's as, it's as simple as that. And, and, and I mean, constantly, uh, and constantly, I've said this many times, what was really, a, uh, at the same time, uh, wonderful and scary is that when you get on the set, you realize every day that, uh, hmm, okay, I don't know anything. <laughs> just, okay, I don't know this. I don't know that. I think I know this. Let me work on this area here. And it's constantly a learning experience. Um, which, as you get older, is, is, um, forces you to try to streamline and just get to the essentials because you have no time to play with all the other, the other stuff. Who is working today as a filmmaker mm. that you look at and say, yeah? I guess it's a hard one to talk about because I can't really talk about my friends. It's like De Palma and right, Coppola right. and Spielberg and... Uh, um, that whole generation. That whole generation. Yeah, I mean, all the there's all aspects. I mean, like Coppola's a great grand painter. And, and, well, you know, but do you two see the mafia differently oh yes him. well totally I, you know he's well how uh well, all i know is like on the street sees, corner yeah. street corner stuff nickels and dimes kind of thing which i, and, I really and he sees the uh his is more well, well, well granted for what we were talking about the godfather we're talking about mario puzo's original right, novel right. then and then the incredible godfather 2 which is one of the greatest films ever made and so godfather 1 also but i number two just fills out it just like grand opera you know, and that is like grand opera. It's something else. It's something else entirely. It's something I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, what's the word? Uh, uh, literally, uh, it's not. I'm not a personal um, um, recognition of that. I never. I didn't have any experience of that. You know, I may have seen it from from afar, but the kind of experience I know, the poor guys in the corner selling the wrong lenses that they just that just stole. Yeah. You know, it, uh, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, but. Uh, uh, no, no, I think um, the, the people, the films I like to see, the two guys whose films I like to watch, but they're, you know, it's an older generation. It's Kubrick right. and Bertolucci. I like to watch their films. They're um, not making many films, though, are no, they? No, they aren't. No. I mean, they're both no. alive. They both have the ability to do yeah. it. Is yeah. it because they didn't, can't, what? I think, though, you see, Kubrick doesn't have to make that many films. Right. What he does is so intense, and he does it, he takes such time in taking it. You can watch one of his films. The one, the one every seven years that come that comes out, uh, Full Metal Jacket, or particularly Barry Lyndon, or The Shining, which is not entirely successful, but the end of it, it doesn't matter. You could find constantly new things that, that they stand um, revisiting, even like The Shining on television when it's shown with commercials yeah. and the, all the words are cut out and yeah. the horror, the horror parts. Are cut, it doesn't matter. I'm looking at the angles. I'm looking at the lighting. Yeah. I'm looking at the psychology of the actors, what they're doing, and it's there's always something new. Bertolucci has a, a certain way that too, where he, where he has a um, it's a wonderful, um, um, uh, elegant quality to the to the imagery, which I like to watch. What else would you put up next to Godfather Two, in your judgment? Well, then then you go back to you, know, you see Godfather Godfather One and Godfather Two were a split in the middle of the old Hollywood and the new Hollywood, yeah. and the great time of the seventies. Seventies was quite a time in America, uh, in, in in making films. Well, the only way I could go I'm, I'm off the top of my head right now, the first thing that comes to mind is definitely. You know um, the films of the older directors, uh, the ones who formulated what film what film is, and uh, John Ford, The Searchers, and uh, My Darling Clementine, and uh, of course uh, Orson Welles's pictures, uh, Citizen Kane, and uh, uh, even the Shakespeare films that he did, The Chimes of Midnight, which is really something. Uh, there's still something that Welles has that's so extraordinary with the use of camera. Um, and then there's, um, uh, in my mind, you know Fellini. We talked yeah, about. Yeah, we talked about that when he died. Yeah, eight and a half. Um, eight and a half being a watershed picture where it's just stopped. Everything that came before is now changed, you know. Yeah. And yet there's another great one of Fellini's, I think, of Vitelloni, the very first one he did, you know. Um, that number, there's so many, I, I, you know. It's, yeah. it's so, there's such a wealth of, of material. Does Bob want to direct? 
De Niro. Well, I, did, I know he did yeah, Mark's Tale. Yeah, I, I, Mark's I, think, I think so. I mean, uh, he seems to be... Although, you know, we don't really see each other that much. Maybe on his birthday or my birthday. <laughs> where go down, I go downtown over where I am, he's with me or something. And uh, uh, we really get to see enough of each other when we're working. So then he's usually off to another picture. Yeah. But um, when you choose a project, he's the first person you think about. I, I realize it's character see, defined. It's character but. defined. And invariably he comes to mind because, you know, it's quite honestly, I mean, there's so many other good actors too at the same time. But I have a relationship with him. And I know one of two things. One, certain things we've done, so maybe we shouldn't deal with that issue. In other words, maybe another actor. Yeah. Or if, if I get to that, I've already done it with Bob, why do I want to do it with another actor anyway? So right. Maybe I shouldn't do that story. But if there's something new to find, um, it's, he's still very, uh, we still have a very uh, close relationship. So we could try to dig this stuff out. And that's why I think of it, you know. And it's, uh, again, that empathy that he has for some of the most unappealing characters. He has a, a strength and a uh, uh, dignity for these people. That comes out of himself, I think. What's next? Next is, <laughs> next is a uh, uh, life story of the Dalai Lama, actually. Yeah. You're directing? Yeah. And who's going to star? Uh, we, we haven't cast it yet. Asian actors. Yeah. It's called Kundun. And, and, and Richard Gere will be the consultant to the film? Uh, no, we have, we have many. Cause he's, he's around. Uh, no, we have. It's the life story of the Dalai Lama, uh, written by Melissa Matheson. Now, why do you want to do that? Well, it's a fascinating story. Here's this guy. Here's this man yeah. who's head of a country, yeah. uh, religious and, and, and uh, uh, spiritual and political head of a country. And the country's been based basically on the spirit. Right. In most for whatever reason, but basically it's the spirit. It's a country that I don't think had a road, if I may be mistaken, didn't have, may not have had a road yeah. going into it until World War II. Didn't need a road, basically. They went in interior, they went inside themselves. And um, uh, it then comes into conflict with um, a government, and a massive government from China, which um, is not just the Chinese people, it's not them, really, it's the Marxist government, which is purely right, materialistic. Right, right. And then what does he do? How does he survive? How does he keep, how does he, what does he do to keep that world of the right. spirit alive, even knowing that it has to change. And certainly it's got to change completely because yeah. it will never be the same. How does a man of the spirit also deal with the fact that exactly. he has to every day confront very practical questions, practical questions of and survival violence. for violence. his people? Yes, yeah, so, and uh, basically nonviolence, right. you know, because that's the tougher road, the nonviolence, that's for sure. This from a man who once thought about being a priest. <laughs> yeah. Great to see you again. You too. Pleasure.